<clears throat> so I've been working for uh, Arizona Game and Fish for uh, since 2002. Uh, and for at least the last eight or nine years of that time, I've been working primarily on connectivity projects. Um, specifically, most of the time, uh, highways related projects. And that is, how are, how are our wildlife uh, populations interacting with our transportation infra infrastructure. Um, and you guys are probably all aware of um, at least one type of interaction. Uh, and you might guess what that is, but based on the warning, if you can actually read that warning. I always forget to warn my audiences, and it's especially pertinent when you're actually eating your lunches, um, that this next slide is a little bit, little bit graphic. Um, yes? Yep, will do. All right, so the most obvious way that our wildlife uh, populations interact with our, our transportation infrastructure are the direct mortalities, those wildlife vehicle collisions. The stats up on this slide are actually pretty old, but they say that um, we lose about one million deer or larger vertebrates in the continental US every year to wildlife vehicle collisions. If you Bring that number, if you include uh, animals down to songbirds and, and rodents and tiny little vertebrates, we lose about one million vertebrates to wildlife vehicle collisions every day in the continental US. Okay? Those numbers are going up. They've, they've pretty much doubled in a 10-year period. Um, and we also lose about 200 people, 200 or more people in the United States every year to wildlife vehicle collisions. So obviously that's a pretty... Um, pretty important uh, hurdle to overcome for both human safety and for wildlife uh, populations out there. But in case people aren't that interested in the persistence of our wildlife, it also does make a, a, a difference to our pocketbooks, our collective pocketbooks. Books. It, costs, it costs our society about $8,000 every time someone hits a deer or about $18,000 every time someone hits an elk. That's an average cost, and it's not all um, burdened. You don't just have one person that has to pay that. Um, but this, was, this is from a report in 2008 that went to Congress that tried to put that sort of a price tag. And what does it cost everyone? What are all the costs associated with these collisions that are happening? And just to, to put it in, in real terms, on the ground, there's a 30-mile stretch of I-17 south of Flagstaff where we have enough deer and elk vehicle collisions on an annual basis that it's effectively costing society uh, $1.7 million every year for the, just for the collisions on that 30-mile stretch of, of highway. So you can imagine what that cost is extrapolated uh, out to the rest of our transportation infrastructure. So even for those folks who may not be motivated, um, to, you know, by saving our wildlife, um, that direct mortality is still an issue for them. And it's, e it's b easier to put it in terms uh, that make it important to them as well. But potentially more important to the persistence of our wildlife is a, a, another way that our, our roads and our development impacts these wildlife populations. And that's by fragmentation. I suspect that most of you, or at least many of you, are familiar with the idea of habitat fragmentation. And that is, as we build up roads, canals, other things, um, we have what was once large, contiguous patches of habitat broken up into smaller and smaller and smaller uh, patches. And as you get down in decreasing size, you lose, the, the number of you lose a number of species that can't persist in a patch that small. And so you have a smaller, lower and lower diversity as you get to, to these smaller habitat parcels. But um, I wanted to spend just a moment and talk about why, um, why do we lose those species as those habitat patches get lower? Well, one thing is we have reduced permeability of that landscape. Um, so even if animals might be able to sometimes get across a particular barrier, uh, in this case right here, we have uh, I-17. Um, this, is, this is in that 30-mile stretch of I-17 south of Flagstaff. We have I-17 coming down. We have some great shelter habitat for elk that they hang out in during the day. And if they want to get out at night to this field and browse or to this water and drink, they've got to now cross I-17. Uh, to put it in human terms, 
uh, you might think about uh, a police blockade keeping you from getting to your, uh, your morning coffee at Starbucks there. Okay? It may not be uh, an end all to, to those daily movements, but it's certainly going to make it a lot harder to get to those resources that they need on a, on a, on a daily basis. Um, and next, if we have a total loss of connectivity, we've got maybe pronghorn that have summer habitat and winter habitat. If you lose, if you put up an impermeable barrier in there, those pronghorn are going to get stuck during the winter in their summer habitat. So um, in 1968 here in Arizona, we lost about 80% of some of our pronghorn herds because they could not escape from a particularly nasty blizzard in northern Arizona. They could not get out of, those hab of, of that area because of the fences and the roadways that had been put into place. So it can be, you can have catastrophic, catastrophic events because of loss of connectivity as well. And finally, um, there's the genetic implications. We could spend the rest of the day talking about how it is that, that smaller, isolated gene pools can, can reduce the viability of a population. Um, or you can, oh, I forgot to mention the, uh, the, putting it in human terms as far as the loss of connectivity. You might imagine what would happen if come April or May, all of our snowbirds here in Phoenix couldn't get back to the North Country. If they had to deal with the August temperatures in Phoenix, um, there would be some pretty uh, substantial implications there. But um, as far as inbreeding goes, I don't know if you can see this picture, but it pretty much sums it all up. Inbreeding is bad. Uh, it's not good for, uh, for the gene pool. It's not good for long-term viability. I think the, the, the title on this one was, He's Not Heavy, He's My Brother and My Cousin and My Dad. Um, so anyway, it's not just, I am going to talk uh, this first half of the first the next section here, I'm going to focus really in on the highways, and that's because that's where I spent my time over the last eight or nine years. Um, but I do want to mention right now um, that it's not just our highways that are fragmenting the landscape. It's the canals, the railroads, the, the sprawl, even alternative energy. Um, you know, it's, it's a necessity, I think, if moving forward to get to where we need to be, but we need to do it smartly and if we're going to limit the fragmentation that, that happens there. Um, there's all kinds of anthropogenic sources for this fragmentation. Um, and you can see this is uh, from building a better, building a quality Arizona. This is a kind of showing the projections of where Arizona is expected to be by the year 2050. These red areas are um, urban developments, basically. And we're going to have, the, su su supposedly we're going to have this megalopolis, I think is what they're calling it, from Tucson all the way up through Prescott. Okay, it's going to be built out. Um, I read the stats yesterday. I can't remember. I think they're expecting this, this area right here to increase in population by about 50% um, from 2010 through 2025. So by 2025, there's supposed to be 50% more people in this area than there were just five years ago. So there's a lot of anthropogenic pressure that's going to be coming uh, in this area. Uh, more, of, more of what we've already seen, okay? And we know now what some of these challenges are. Um, what can we do about them? Well, thankfully for all of us, if you ever saw Back to the Future 2, we only have a few months left until October 21st, 2015, when apparently we aren't going to need to have any more roads because we'll have flying cars and everything. Um, you know, that's, that's when Doc Brown said uh, we wouldn't need any roads. Um, but if that does happen to fall through, then there's really, honestly, not much that, that me, as a member of Arizona Game and Fish Department, there's not much I can do or even our department can do if we're standing alone trying to do it. Um, partnerships are critical. They're crucial. They're the most important part of what we do. Um, and there are a whole host of organizations, agencies, nonprofits, uh, institutions that are participating. And this doesn't, this is not comprehensive. We've got a lot of other groups that have been helping us along the way as well. Um, I need to update it uh, again. Um, but it's through these partnerships that we can start to take some evasive action. We can start to deal with some of the challenges 
that are, we're already facing and more importantly those that are, that are coming uh, in the near future. Um, so I want to talk about three kind of case studies, three of our big highway projects that we've had some, some pretty good success with um, over the last decade or so, decade plus. The first one is Arizona State Route 260. Um, and it's in this area east of Payson. There's a 17 mile stretch of highway that ADOT reconstructed from about 2001 or 2002 and they finished it in 2013. Um, it was a stretch of highway that they were taking from uh, just a two lane road, lots of windy curves. They straightened it out, they divided it into a, divide, uh, a four lane divided highway. Um, and along with that, they knew there was gonna be increased traffic, increased speeds, and increased elk collisions, which were already, uh, I think, the highest in the state on this section of highway. So they knew that they needed to do something. So in that section of highway, they were already, regardless of wildlife, they had to build six bridges in that stretch anyhow. But because of the, the, the concern for um, wildlife, for elk and deer collisions, they actually took what would have been uh, just little drainage culverts and maybe even little metal pipe culverts and they built them out into uh, wildlife underpasses when they rebuilt the road. Um, and so we ha now have 17 uh, underpasses in this 17 mile stretch of 260. Uh, we wanted to evaluate as this thing, as this stuff was being built, we wanted to evaluate uh, whether or not these underpasses were actually functioning for elk. Uh, and what was it about one structure that might make it better than another structure? So to, to do that, we uh, used some video surveillance around these underpasses, and we looked at the number of approaches versus the number of crossings. We came up with this passage rate uh, statistic that we could use to compare these structures. These two structures in particular were extremely good for uh, comparison because they're only 200 meters apart. They open onto the same meadow. They have the same elk that are basically approaching each of them, um, and we can look at those, that passage rate statistic to see <clears throat> which ones the elk preferred, which one the elk preferred. And they preferred very much, heavily the, the one um, on the far side there, the right as you're looking at it. And those, those earthen slopes we determined uh, were highly preferable to those vertical concrete walls on the left side. We were able to actually incorporate that recommendation into some of the subsequently built underpasses. They would have looked, the original plans had some of those underpasses um, designed to look like this, but once we found this, this information out, we were able to convince ADOT to redesign them to look more like that. Um, this graphic shows over a four year period the passage rates of five different underpasses. Uh, and you can see uh, that they do start significantly different, a lot of these things, um, but over time, four out of the five did kind of converge up to about a 65 to 80% passage rate, uh, which means that I think that one of the most important take homes from this whole uh, effort was that you need to have long-term monitoring in order to effectively say whether or not these, these mitigations, these, these uh, measures are actually successful. And you notice this, this one structure here down on the bottom, it started off at only about 12%, it ended up at less than 5%, I believe, um, and it's actually located right here next to an ADOT maintenance yard. So that human activity is what, we're figure, what we figure is driving that. There's actually some other factors that I'm, I'm sure are working into the low success on that structure. Um, but, uh, but location obviously is quite important to where these things end up. <clears throat> and so we wanted to look not just at the structures themselves, but we wanted to look at the um, movements of the elk and the deer uh, relative to the whole highway project. And so in order to do that, not just at those crossing structures, but across the whole landscape, we needed to look at their, to collect their movements, and we did that through GPS collaring. So we would put these clover traps out, um, we bait them in the evening with alfalfa hay and salt blocks, and we'd check them in the morning, and we'd hope not to find that. <laughs> um, it did occur every once in a while. Um, usually only, I think this is the only time we ever got two cows in one trap. Um, but we did try not to trap when there was livestock in those, those particular pastures. Um, this is what we preferred to see. We have a cow elk here this time, and we would restrain the animal um, 
get it down, tied down, put a blindfold on it, get a collar on it, an ear tag in its ear, and send it on its way. And we get out of the way. Um, sometimes they just, maybe about a quarter of the time, they just sit there and wait and kind of check out their surroundings. Um, but a lot of the time, they bolt right out of there. Um, but it, the whole process only takes about maybe 10 minutes. Um, and we don't have to use any, uh, any drugs to, uh, to put the animals under, which is, it is a definite benefit. So once we get that, those collars out, we get the data back actually from them. One of the things we're most interested, we were most interested in on this project and most of our projects, where is it that these animals are actually crossing the road? So we break the highway into 10th mile sections and then we effectively just do a tally for each of those 10th mile sections. <clears throat> and we end up with a histogram that just shows which, is the most, which are the most important 10th um, mile segments of highway. This is real data from, uh, I think it's about a three mile stretch, three or four mile stretch of uh, 260. Um, and the, I don't know if you can see it from where you're at, but the, uh, each of these blocks down on the bottom represents a planned crossing structure, <coughs> underpass or bridge, um, underpass effectively. And then the yellow bars here indicate the planned fencing. Well, you can see this planned fencing wasn't going to capture, um, wasn't going to funnel the animals to the crossing structures um, that were already crossing in this area right here. There's no fencing. Those animals are going to continue to cross the highway at that place, at, at those locations. So we, again, we um, conferred with our ADOT partners and <clears throat> we got them to extend the fencing just another 20% of, the, of the, the, the total highway distance, um, but we were able to bring up the, uh, we, in the end, we had less than 50% of that highway fenced, funnel fenced, um, but we were able to actually intercept almost 90% of those crossings. So it really speaks to the cost effectiveness of those measures. You, you really wanna, in order to use your money, the, the the most effective, in the most effective means, uh, you need to have the best data possible. Um, the fencing itself is, is extremely important, that funnel fencing, and we're talking, for, for those of you who aren't aware, we're talking about basically eight foot, eight foot high fence that's gonna keep the elk and deer from getting onto that highway. It's gonna funnel them to these crossing structures. Uh, this is collision data for that same actual section of 260 near Christopher Creek. And this is collision data for actually the one year following the construction of the underpasses. Again, each one of these uh, black outlined segments is a segment that has an underpass on it. So we still had 51 collisions even though the underpasses were built, but there was no funnel fencing built at this point. The following year, after that 50% of the highway was, was fenced, we had just eight collisions. It's an 84% reduction in, in collisions. And these three collisions here were actually relative, or were related to um, a, an issue with a, basically a, a place where they couldn't close the hole, a gap in the fence. Um, so had we been able to do, to, to, had they been able to deal with that, it would have been an even greater reduction in collisions. And eventually they did succeed in, in doing that. Um, so the next project I wanted to talk about for just a moment uh, is US Highway 93. It's up here in the northwest corner of the state near the Hoover Dam. It's related to the realignment of this about 18, 17 or 18 mile section of highway. Um, when they built the Pat Tillman, Michael Callahan um, bridge to bypass the Hoover Dam. So I don't know if you guys have been up to Vegas anytime recently, but you no longer drive across the Hoover Dam. Um, <clears throat> in doing, rebuilding this highway, again, they knew that there were a lot of sheep vehicle collisions and they knew that they were going to be increasing traffic and speeds. So they were going to increase that issue. And they wanted to deal with it uh, in an appropriate way. Um, but they didn't have money to do 17 crossing structures over the, the course of this 17 or 18 mile uh, highway. So it became ex extremely important. Where is the best place to put these crossing structures? <clears throat> and so again, we use GPS collars on the bighorn sheep. Uh, you can't get sheep to go into a trap, so you use a helicopter and a net gun. Um, fire the net at the sheep. Uh, the person who actually gets to jump out of the helicopter and tackle the sheep, believe it or not, is called the mugger. It's a tremendous amount of fun. Um, very, uh, 
very, very good adrenaline rush involved. Um, but you get, the, you get the sheep untangled, blindfolded, get the collar on. We actually usually take a genetics and sometimes disease samples uh, for these animals since we happen to be handling them anyway. Um, get that ear tag on and send them on their way. <clears throat> they did this for US 93 in between 2004 and 2006. <clears throat> and they determined that of all the crossings that were out there, if they put mitigation in three, along three specific ridgelines, they could capture 82% of those bighorn sheep crossings. And so they did. Um, they determined those, that's where they're going to put their, that's where they're going to focus the money. They're going to funnel animals to those spots. And because of a concurrent or, or almost concurrent study, uh, they determined that underpasses were not going to work for sheep. Can't get the sheep to effectively go underneath the highway. So they, they actually, um, they agreed to build three wildlife overpasses for the bighorn sheep at these three ridge lines. This is what they look like. This is what it looks like to a sheep on the, the uh, overpass. <clears throat> we also installed surveillance systems on there so we could again determine passage rates um, and see how effective these structures were. Uh, this is not the first video that we got, but this is one of our, our most popular videos. I don't know if you guys can see it, but that lamb is about a day or two old, I figure. Um, and so not only are the sheep, not only are the, the rams and the ewes getting across, but these newborn, these young lambs are, are never going to know a time when they weren't um, using these structures. We've had over 4,000, I think it might actually be 5,000 crossings now um, of these three overpasses since they opened in 2011, I believe it was. So tremendously successful. <clears throat> The last of the three example project, highway projects that I want to talk about is, is actually a little bit more on a landscape scale. Uh, rather than talking about just one barrier, we've got three different highways that we're looking at. Um, but it did spawn out of a couple of, of those specific highway projects. Um, one of the, the, the main one is US 89, which runs north out of Flagstaff uh, up towards Page. And so again, we were interested in the pronghorn movements relative to that highway. So we went out and did another helicopter net gun capture. We used people on the ground and in the air to find the animals. <clears throat> they shot the net on, on the pronghorn. We get that collar on them again and send them on their way to collect data for us. And this is all of the data, half of the data essentially, from that, the first phase of that project. And so what you're seeing here is a dot for each location that was taken. Each color represents a different animal. And that's every dot for every animal that was captured on the east side of the highway. There is not a single dot west of the highway there. <clears throat> this is every dot for every animal that was captured west of the highway. You do notice that there are a few orange dots here. We did have one out of the total 37 animals that ended up crossing this highway in that first phase of the project. Incidentally, she crossed uh, during a time of the year where there's pretty much no chance that there would have been any actual genetic interchange there. Um, I don't have a slide in here this time because I was trying to cut it down, but my, my master's project actually involved the, the gene flow here of this whole landscape from the east side of US 89 all the way to the west side of 64. And what we found was that there is differentiation starting um, amongst these, these populations. <clears throat> So the, the title of my presentation, I'm just finally now getting around to it, was why didn't the pronghorn cross the road? There's a, a few things that work into that, but one of the biggest, uh, one thing that I think everyone would agree, every pronghorn biologist would agree on, is that these fences are an issue. Deer, elk, and as you can see here, Steve McQueen, all prefer to go over the fences. Um, pronghorn, 95% of the time, I would say, go under the fences. They do, once in a while, go over them, but almost, almost never. I've seen it, I think, once, one event. Um, and when you get a fence next to a highway, next to a fence, you end up with a virtually impermeable barrier, which is what we saw with those first 37 animals that were collared. So we... Um, we, we generated another histogram looking at not crossings of this stretch of highway, but approaches of the, to the highway. And we made in our report to ADOT recommendations for three crossing structures here on this, this segment of US 89. 
Um, and this is what we'd like to see one day. This is actually what we were hoping to see by about now, actually. Um, but the ADOT project that this was a part of uh, was actually shelved back in 2008, 2009, when the bottom dropped out of everything. They lost the money. They are not doing a whole lot of new projects and rebuilding a whole lot of sections of highway. And until they go back and rebuild, reconstruct this highway, they're not going to go in and build an overpass um, in the meantime. So <clears throat> in the interim, because it might be decades, it probably will be decades before we see an overpass out there, uh, we uh, are now in the midst of doing some kind of midterm mitigations here. Uh, it happens that this section of, this is just an, a blow up of the, uh, that first phase of, of the US 89 movement data. And this is US 89 going through uh, the Wapaki National Monument. That, that uh, purple base layer is Wapaki National Monument. There's no livestock grazing on here, which means we don't need um, right of way fence lining that section of highway. So we met with the Park Service, ADOT, and Babbitt Ranches, who are the, the, has the permit for most of the surrounding lands. Um, and we were actually able to remove the fencing in that area. And what we saw, we went out and collared more pronghorn right after that. We saw eight out of 15, I, was, I believe it was, of those, the next phase of, uh, next um, group of pronghorn actually ended up crossing that road. So it is the fence that we need to deal with. And we are in the process, we're actually well through, most of the way through the um, eight or nine fence modification projects where we, we can't remove fence in most other places. But what we're doing instead is moving it backwards. We're giving the, the pronghorn a place to stage. It crosses a fence. It's not stuck right there next to the highway. It can hold on. It can um, wait until it's comfortable, cross the road. And then again, it doesn't have to immediately cross that fence again. And we just this past fall and winter, we put out another 50 or so collars on pronghorn. So we're already going to be, we're already gathering data to see how well these things are working. We don't have that data in hand yet, but we will have it in a, in a few years. Okay, so I don't know how, okay, I still got some time. Um, I want to switch gears and talk more about that landscape level stuff. Um, and these projects and these efforts that I'm going to talk about for the rest of the, the time here, I haven't been as uh, much a part of on a daily basis, but I have been um, increasingly involved in some of these efforts. Uh, back in 2006, there was a, a partnership, a whole number, uh, a whole host of partners here, um, that got together and, and produced this uh, Arizona Wildlife Linkages Assessment document. And it was a statewide, at a statewide scale, they looked to see what is it across the state, where are the habitat blocks that are intact, what are the um, fracture zones, and where are the potential linkages that might connect these habitat blocks across these, ha these fracture zones. Um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time um, trying to, to explain what linkages and corridors are. I'm guessing a, a lot of you guys um, already are familiar. You're, some of you are probably way more familiar with the, this context than I am. Um, but in general, you have these habitat blocks here. Um, these are the areas that are intact habitat that, that the populations are spending. Any given um, wildlife population is spending most of its time in these kind of core area habitat patches. But in order to persist, they need to move between them. And so you have these linkages, which is a kind of a general term for just an area which, between which these animals can move. And the corridors, which is typically um, means the more specific pathway that's actually connecting these habitat blocks. Um, I pirated this slide and a few others out of some other presentations that some of my colleagues have given. Um, but I just, and I don't want to spend too much time on them, but I wanted to kind of run you through some of the basics. Um, the bigger the corridor, the, if a, a corridor that's unbroken is better than a corridor that's broken. Uh, a wider corridor is better than a narrow corridor. More than one is better than one. Um, natural is better than unnatural. And structurally diverse is better than a monotypic sort of vegetative or, or structural um, corridor. Okay, it's, it's all kind of intuitive stuff, um, but it does bear um, mentioning. Uh, we do often get a question, I, I don't know how many times now I've gotten the question, well, how wide do you need a corridor to maintain pronghorn movement? The answer is we don't know yet, 
Um, I don't know if we'll ever know because it's extremely difficult to test. You know, is this size going to be going to work? Is this size going to work? You may be able to say, well, it, it obviously isn't working in that case, but you can't change the size of a corridor um, between two habitat patches and, and test that for pronghorn. Um, so those kind of um, suggestions are what we have to go on. Uh, from those 2006, from that 2006 project or product, that uh, linkages assessment, um, some of the some of the linkages were selected as being uh, kind of a top priority or a first priority for specific modeling, and that is um, they took these they they put them into a GIS format, a geospatial format, and they did what they call least cost corridor modeling. They looked at a whole number of uh, focal species, uh, usually between like 15 and 30, I think, species. <clears throat> and they looked at, they tried to connect, find the best way to connect habitat patches. Here we have uh, some BLM land in the Gila Bend Mountains and some more BLM land in the Sonoran Desert National Monument. Um, and, I, and eventually you get up to the Estrella Mountains here. Um, and the idea is, well, we, wanna, we know we want to be able to keep, maintain wildlife movement uh, between these habitat blocks, but what's going to be the most important uh, pathway to protect for those species? For not just one species, but for the whole host of species that are out there. Um, and there's a, a number of different ways for trying to build those models. In fact, I just went to a really great talk uh, a couple of weeks ago in uh, New Mexico um, from a woman who works in the Bayer Lab. And the Bayer Lab up at NAU is the one who actually came up with this tool uh, for least cost corridors. Um, and she is working on <clears throat> evaluating how those model models are built. And in other words, how do, they, how, do the way, how do they define the resistance that is applied to um, to the movement across these areas. Uh, and I can talk or at least send you to other people who know more about it than me uh, if you guys have questions later on uh, about how is it that these least cost corridor models are built. But anyway, there was a, a significant amount of effort put towards I think about 16 of those models um, in, a, in the first few years and there have been other ones subsequently done across the state. <clears throat> We've also been doing um, or been participating in this countywide um, linkage assessments or connectivity assessments where we kind of took the same approach as that 2006 product, but we wanted, a, that, that was kind of a coarse scale. We wanted to refine it a little bit, so we invited at a county level all of the different stakeholders that we could think of. Hopefully some of the folks in this room participated in the Maricopa County one. Um, and we basically got everybody together had them draw on maps and, and point at stuff and say, what do you think is important for these wildlife? We did some processing back in, in our GIS lab. Our GIS folks did some processing and put together the, this report, which if anyone is interested, I can provide uh, a link to that, or I can get you a, a copy of it if, you're, if you'd like. <clears throat> and so uh, I do wanna now walk you through the process on a couple of these projects that have been included in this that were included in that 2006 linkage assessment and what's been done with them since then. So this is north of Tucson. Tucson is right down just off the screen here. We have the Catalina Mountains. Um, we have the Tortolita Mountains here. And this AWL number 81, that was identified in that 2006 report as an important linkage to maintain. Uh, right around 2006, or actually I think in 2006, there was also this uh, there was an urban interface lion project going on near Tucson, and they were able to collect some mountain lion movement data around uh, Tucson. The first one of those animals that they collared, um, actually they collared it down here in the Catalinas. I got to fly these and collect the, the, the data off of them. And one day it disappeared. It wasn't in the Catalinas anymore. It, I searched for like two or three hours. And finally on the way to, to refuel over in Marana, we heard it in the Tortolitas. Okay, and then subsequently it moved not just to the Tortolitas, but almost up to Picacho Peak and up into the Blacks. That one lion moved quite a distance. You can see that for a species, a wide-ranging species like mountain lion, you really need to incorporate a whole 
host of habitat blocks, of interconnected habitat blocks, if you want the, that species to persist. And so some of this data was actually used in that buyer model, uh, or in a buyer model, to develop this corridor design. That least cost corridor, path, uh, corridor tool was used. And then within that, there was um, a selected corridor, at, a, a corridor that was selected by some of the local stakeholders. The conservation, or no, the Coalition for Sonoran Desert Protection, um, and a, a number of different, uh, Sky Island Alliance was involved, a no, number of organizations, Audubon, uh, Tucson Audubon, I believe, is, is very, uh, plays a very strong role in this group. They got together and they discussed with the municipalities around how can they actually preserve this corridor, this movement. Uh, and one of the things that they were able to convince all parties um, involved to do um, was create an actual pas passage structure um, along this highway, which is currently, right now, being uh, rebuilt. So that's State Route 77. They, they convinced them to take, this is an old picture of, of that section of highway. Um, this is an artist's rendering of what they were, hope, what they were hoping to see. And that's a picture uh, that I took about two and a half weeks ago or so. And these little abutments right there are the beginnings of that wildlife overpass. It's being built right now. So things like javelina, mule deer, mountain lion, maybe even bighorn sheep, if they ever get up to numbers again like they used to be in the area, can potentially use this to get from the Catalina Mountains to the, to the Tortolita Mountains again. Um, another project that is probably more pertinent to most of the folks in the room here is the White Tanks, um, the White Tanks area. Uh, one of my colleagues in the Wildlife Contracts branch uh, kind of headed up this, this project, I think it was around 2008, I think the report came out, came out in 2009, I believe. Um, but it's, the, you ha we have the, the White Tanks Regional Park, and we want to try and maintain connectivity with this habitat block into the surrounding areas that are scheduled, the, through the surrounding areas which are, are slated for development, some scale of development in the near future, uh, we want to be able to maintain movement of deer, mountain lion, whatever else needs to get out of that area and into these other habitat patches. Um, so they, they collared mule deer, um, and these dots that you see here, again, each dot is a location of a deer, each color represents a different deer, and you can see that they, you know, there's definitely areas of concentrated use, um, and there's definitely some crossings of that Sun Valley Parkway, which was the most, uh, the, the most substantial barrier that they had to movement in the area. Um, and you can see, hopefully from this graphic, that the crossings were not, gen were not just random. There were spikes that were associated with water, turns out they were associated with water structures. Um, and so um, that my colleague um, modeled some of these, uh, put together maps and product, a product which showed the most important areas for crossings of that Sun Valley Parkway. <clears throat> Where is it the most important that we allow these deer to get across that, um, that roadway? Um, he also put collars on at least one mountain lion. I'm not sure if there was a second one or not. Um, but you can see again the, the difference in scale when we incorporate a species like, mule, or like lions um, rather than mule deer. The mule deer they obviously have to have a fair bit of, of area to persist, but mountain lions are a whole order of magnitude higher. Um, it moves out of the white tanks, into the Belmonts, um, all over this area, up into the vultures, okay? And, and they need those interconnected habitat patches in order to survive. Um, and so they, they took the mule deer data, and they took the um, lion data, and some other habitat um, data, and they built another one of these linkage models, okay, these, these least cost uh, corridor models, connecting the white tanks with all these other mountain ranges out here. And with that product, um, one of my colleagues in, out of our Mesa office, Dana Warnicke, she, um, she helped with a lot of these slides actually. Um, she 
uh, she participated with Surprise and helped them actually incorporate this connectivity, these connectivity recommendations into their general plan. So the, they have this stuff in there. They have triggers so that when development comes, um, connectivity is going to be part of the conversation uh, as, as far as what's going to happen. Um, and they also have guidelines as far as if something is going to be built on the edge of one of these, path, of one of these corridors that's been identified. Um, there's more, I have other slides um, that I haven't included in the presentation, but if you're interested in some of these other specifications, I can, I can pass them on to you. Um, and then uh, the last kind of project that I wanted to talk about was the, Sonor, the um, McDowell Sonoran Preserve project. And it's one that uh, actually the same colleague who did the, the mule deer and lion stuff out, the, out at the white tanks, he did some, some kind of linkage assessment work for them uh, back in 2012, I believe he finished his report. He looked at some of the road mortalities along a particular road that, that runs through this kind of linkage area between the two big habitat blocks. And he also did some track uh, counts along some of the washes and roads and stuff in there. Uh, but right now, we are working with the preserve and the city of Scottsdale. We are planning, hopefully, if everything goes right, we're planning to start to, to put some collars on mule deer next January or February so that we can do a similar assessment to the White Tanks project. We're going to look at where are those deer moving in and around and, and to these other habitat blocks. Um, what do seasonal movements look like? Are there gender differences? How do they relate to some of the vegetative data that the Sonoran, McDowell Sonoran Institute has already collected? Um, and how do they, um, what are the migration corridors or movement corridors that we need to, to really focus on as far as preserving the species? Uh, and if everything goes really well, then we'll actually put some lion collars out in this area as well, because we, we do want to see that, that higher level of, of connectivity um, addressed. Uh, and finally, I just wanted to, um, to talk about, take a moment and talk about some of the challenges that we have moving forward. Uh, there's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not too different than most of the other challenges that we face for wildlife today. Um, it's the most important thing is developing and maintaining these partnerships. We need to be able to work across agency lines with um, public interest groups, with um, institutions, with everybody involved, everybody that's interested in not just the wildlife resources, but any resource that's out there. We've got to have them all at the table so that we can, um, we can get good things done for wildlife. That's probably the most important thing. Um, we want to get connectivity recognized as a priority by critical stakeholders. We've got partners like ADOT that are already on board in a lot of occasions. Sometimes we, you know, we need to provide them with a little bit more incentive for some critters that maybe aren't a human safety issue. They maybe aren't um, a threatened and endangered species issue. So we, we are still developing uh, the incentive for them to work on, uh, to, to really make those sorts of connectivity still a priority. Um, other stakeholders like maybe the railways, um, BNSF, um, even State Lands Department, they don't necessarily have the motivation right now. There's nothing that's bringing them to the, that, that's, I don't want to say forcing them to the table, but there's no incentive to really be at the table. There's no benefit to them to actually play ball with us. So we want to try, that's one of the big challenges that I see, is really finding a way to get them to the table to make it worth their while to come and, and put connectivity as a priority on their, um, on their planning, in their planning documents. Um, we want to incorporate connectivity into the standard pro planning process. Right now, the standard way that we operate on a lot of our highways projects especially is, or we ha at least the standard way we have operated, is we'll hear about a project going on and then we'll rush in and try and get in as early as we can. And sometimes we're able to get in there early enough that they can, they can plan around what, what our concerns are. A lot of the times we have heard about these projects too late to really make much of a difference. You've got to get in there early. If we can get into the standard planning process, if we can create a trigger 
at ADOT or at, in these municipalities, if we can get it into their general plans, like at, in Surprise, then they'll come asking questions. We don't want to create a directive that anybody has to do some, this or that. We want to create triggers to start conversations so that they come asking questions early on. Um, we want to be able to collect data to maximize the cost effectiveness. I talked about you know, only fencing a portion of 260 and that ended up capturing, it ended up dealing with a whole lot of the potential impacts that that roadway could, could have. Um, a little bit of investment up front on collecting that data can save a whole lot of money in the long run. If we hadn't done that, you know, you'd have to basically fence the whole thing and make sure that there's enough structures in that whole area that you're going to maintain connectivity across the whole stretch of highway. So a little bit of upfront investment can, can um, reduce, can improve the cost effectiveness, but it can often be very difficult to get that money up front rather than during a project. Um, and finally, we need to secure long-term protection for these, for both the habitat blocks and for the corridors themselves. Uh, we don't want to build an overpass, uh, for example, in an area that in 10 years from now might, be, might lead from a Walmart parking lot to, uh, you know, to a bank or something like that. Um, we need to have kind of a long-term security for these areas to make sure that the investment that's needed to make them viable is not going to be wasted or, or uh, negated in the near future. And with that, um, I will take any questions that anybody's got. I, uh, I would say, you know, we, I put 115-ish, didn't I, I don't think? So maybe 10 or 15 minutes for sure. questions. I would ask, actually, I'll The question, I think, was about uh, the I-17 and I-10. I think that they're calling it the spine of the valley corridor, which effectively is, is mainly right in the valley. And, and it, I did see that some, one of our uh, transportation kind of project coordinators um, came over and talked to me about it a couple of days ago. And we looked at the, the scope of that particular project. There's not a lot that we had major concerns with. Um, it's, yeah, it's too late, but it's mostly urban. And the only area that, that we saw that we wanted to make sure that we thought was worth mentioning was was the Rio Salado actually you know where it crosses the Rio Salado I would imagine they're probably going to be maintaining kind of the stuff what's what they've got and if that's the case we're probably okay with that but um, if they were to to change significantly the way they cross the Rio Salado then we would certainly have an, uh, want to to put in some uh, comments on that but of course magazine uh, so the question is regarding the um, motivation to mun municipalities and other agencies. Yeah, is there, is there consideration for legislation to, to help kind of twist arms or motivate? Um, you know, you start getting into legislative stuff that's way above my pay scale. Um, I, I think that there are conversations about it but I don't think that anyone is pursuing, anyone in our agency is pushing that right now, um, mainly because I don't think that they see it as a, as a short-term viable option. I don't think that they are ex expecting that there would be much legislation currently that would steer folks in that, in that direction. And as a side note to that, you know, we, in our, our partnerships with the, a lot of these entities, most of them, most of them, um, we want to approach them as not a, an authoritative, you know, directing you have to do this. We want to extend an invitation, and we've had a lot of luck with ADOT uh, framing our projects not as problems and issues and, and, um, and obstacles, but as opportunities for improvement. You know, uh, rolling them in with these projects that are ongoing. When ADOT goes to rebuild a section of highway, 
you know, they're not going out and having to just build a, a crossing structure for, for elk or an overpass for bighorn sheep outside of other work that they're doing. We are taking the, the projects that they are already going to do, um, you know, rebuilding I-17 or rebuilding 260 or 93, and we're, we're turning them into opportunities to not only maintain, but to actually restore and improve connectivity. It's, it helps in that relationship. I, it, I think it helps develop that relationship by suggesting it and, and, and framing it as an opportunity rather than as a problem. And it also, uh, a nice side benefit is that the only negative public comments that we seem to get from our, our highways projects is why is taxpayer money being spent on X mitigation structure? Um, if you have a structure, if, Ada, if somebody is building something just on its own, then that cost, you know, some of these overpasses might cost a million dollars or something like that, um, you know, or half a million or a million and a half. It, it depends on a lot of different things. If that cost is just put out to the public on its own, it can sound like quite a bit. And it is, I mean, it's a substantial amount of money. It's a substantial investment. If you can put it next to the cost of a highway upgrade, like the 93, US 93 realignment and, and bypass bridge project, which were at least, uh, I, Ray, do you remember, is it about $500 million for that project? Half of that, Half of that $250 million for that highway project. We have about $5 million maybe that were wildlife related. It's a tiny, you know, it's less than 1% of, well, whatever. It's a tiny amount of uh, less than 2% of the project. 